in this lecture, I shall deal with the principles and techniques of stereographic projection and will also talk about some important applications of stereographic projection. Now, what is meant by stereographic projection? You see, when we deal with three dimensional crystals, very often we have to deal with angles between crystallographic planes, angle between crystallographic directions, angle between a crystallographic plane and a crystallographic direction etcetera, etcetera. Now, how this can be done in a very easy method? You see human beings find it quite difficult to comprehend a three dimensional object. That is the reason why the information of a three dimensional object is resolved into two dimensional form. For example, when you look at a globe, we know that geographic atlases are nothing but some kind of two dimensional projection of a three dimensional globe. But the principle behind that kind of projection is that this projection is area true projection. That means, a country which is really big on the surface of the globe will occupy a bigger space than a country which has a smaller area on the globe in the geographical atlases. So, geographical atlases are so to say area true projection. So, geographical atlases are area true projection, but a stereographic projection means it is an angle true projection. So, a stereographic projection means an angle true projection. Now, let us see how we can bring all the data regarding a three dimensional crystal into some two dimensional form and this is what is known as the stereographic projection. Now, let us assume that we have a unit cell of a crystal and here we consider a simple cubic unit cell. The six planes of this unit cell are as shown here. The front plane is 1 0 0, the back plane is bar 1 0 0, the right hand side plane is 0 1 0, the left hand side plane is 0 bar 1 0, the top plane is 0 0 1, the bottom plane is 0 0 bar 1. Now, if we consider the unit cell to be very, very small, so small that it can be considered as nothing but a single point. And then what we do? Keeping that point unit cell as the center, we construct a big sphere around it and that sphere is known as the reference sphere. So, we put the point unit cell at the center and construct a big sphere around that, we call it the reference sphere. The next step is to draw perpendiculars to the six faces of the unit cell. So, the perpendicular from the front plane 100 will cut the reference sphere 
at the point 1 0 0 here. So, this point is known as this point on the sphere is known as the pole of the 1 0 0 plane. Now, similarly, the perpendicular to the back plane bar 1 0 0 cuts the reference sphere over here and this is the pole of the bar 1 0 0 plane. Similarly, the perpendicular to the 0 1 0 plane cuts the reference sphere here. So, this is the pole of the 0 1 0 plane, this is the pole of 0 bar 1 0 plane. Similarly, this is the pole of the 0 0 1 plane and this is the pole of the 0 0 bar 1 plane. So, what we have done? We have reduced the 6 planes of the unit cell into 6 points lying on the surface of the reference sphere. Then what we do? We put a source of light right at the top, we call it the point of projection and allow the rays of light to pass through all the different poles lying on the surface of the reference sphere and allow these lights to fall on a piece of paper which is lying perpendicular to the main direction of the light. So, the situation is we have got, let me draw it over here, it will be easier. So, we have got a reference sphere So, the situation is we have got the point unit cell at the center of a big reference sphere. So, this reference sphere is such that half of the reference sphere you will see on the top of the board, the remaining half of the sphere will be at the bottom of the board, at, at the back side of the board I am sorry. So, now what happens that the pole of 1 0 0 plane will be over here and exactly at the opposite point backwards the pole of bar 1 0 0 will be. The pole of 0 1 0 will be here, pole of 0 bar 1 0 here, pole of 0 0 1 plane will be there, pole of 0 0 bar 1 plane will be there. Now, what we do? We take a piece of paper and put it perpendicular to this axis and put a source of light over there and allow the source of light, the light rays to pass through all the poles and fall on this piece of paper. Now, if we do that, the whole of the reference sphere, it will be projected as a circle. The whole of the reference sphere will be projected as a circle and we call it the basic circle. So, we put a source of light on top and allow the light rays to pass through all the poles of the various planes and fall on this piece of paper which is taken perpendicular to this line. So, the entire uh, sphere, reference sphere 
will be projected as what is known as a basic circle. Now, in the basic circle, we know that the 100 pole, which is over here, this light ray will pass through that 100 and cut it over here. So, if we draw a basic circle, this is where the 100 pole will be projected by the light rays. Similarly, on the back side, the bar 100 pole will be falling. So, here the bar 100 pole will lie on the basic circle. So, on the basic circle, where the 010 pole will lie, it will lie on the right hand side here. So, this point is the 010 pole on the basic circle, where this one lie, it will be at the left hand side. So, here there will be the 0 bar 10 pole and the 0, 0, 001 and 0, 0, bar 1, they will be right at the center. Okay. So, you see that in this kind of a projection, now we have replaced the, we have replaced the 6 atomic planes by 6 points on the basic circle and these are nothing but the projections of the poles of the 6 planes. Now, this diagram is known as a stereographic projection. So, this is what is known as a stereographic projection. So, you see that this is the diagram which is now which is known as a stereographic projection. As I said before, this is the basic circle and the projected 100 point will be here, the projected bar 100 point will be here, the projected 0 bar 10 will be here, the projected 0 1 0 will be here, the projected 0 0 1 or 0 0 bar 1 will be here. Now, we call it a stereographic projection. What is the reason? Because this projection is actually an angle true projection. How come? You see, if you look at the angle between say 100 pole and 0 1 0 pole, this is 90 degree. And if you look at the actual unit cell, the 100 plane makes a 90 degree angle with the 0 1 0 plane. So, let us draw it once again. So, if we draw a unit cell on the board, now this front plane will be the 100 plane of the unit cell. This right hand side plane will be the 0, 010 plane of the unit cell. So, how much is the angle between these two planes? Naturally, it is 90 degree. So, the angle between these planes is 90 degree. And when we look at the projected poles of 100 and 010, they are also making an angle 90 degree between them. So, you see that this projection that we have drawn is angle true. Angle between 100 pole and 010 pole is 90 degrees and the actual angle between the planes 100 and 010 90 degree. Now, you take any two pairs of poles and find out the angle and you will see that you know they will tally with the angular relationship these planes have between themselves. So, we can now say that our uh, projection which we have drawn here is nothing but a stereographic projection because it is an angle true projection. Now, in this stereographic projection, what kind of 
poles we have plotted in this stereographic projection we have plotted the poles of 1 0 0 type planes only in this stereographic projection we have plotted the poles of 1 0 0 type of planes only now if we want to plot the poles of other type of planes say for example if we want to plot the 1 1 0 type of poles in the same stereographic projection then how to proceed now look at the 1 1 0 plane in the unit cell so this red colored plane this is the 1 1 0 plane this is the 1 1 0 plane in the unit cell now naturally if we look at the perpendicular to that plane so in this diagram in this diagram where is our so coming back to this diagram on the board coming back to this diagram on the board we see that this is the 1 1 0 plane so naturally if we draw the perpendicular to the 1 1 0 plane where it is going to be you see the perpendicular to 1 0 0 is coming like this perpendicular to 0 1 0 is going like that and since this plane bisects these uh, you know the angle between this and this, the perpendicular to that will lie midway between the perpendiculars to 1 0 0 and 0 1 0. If that is the case, we will have the perpendicular to this plane, you know, coming like, you know, making the same angle with the pole of, with the perpendicular to 1 0 0 plane and the perpendicular to 1 1 0 plane. If that be the case, where do we expect to get a pole, get the pole of 1, 1, 0? So, if this is the pole of 1, 0, 0 plane and that is the pole of 0, 1, 0 plane, then the pole of 1, 1, 0, the projected pole of 1, 1, 0 must be lying midway between the two because the perpendicular to the 1, 1, 0 plane lies exactly midway between the perpendicular to 1 0 0 and 0 1 0. So, the position of the projected pole of 1 1 0 will be here. In a similar way, where are the poles of all the other 1 1 0 type poles going to be? Now, we have found out a simple uh, reason that it will be lying in between the poles of any two 1 0 0 type of poles. So, if that be the case, the other locations of the 1 1 0 type poles will be this one, will be this one, here, 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 here and here. So, you see that the 1 1 0 type poles will be lying between exactly midway between the poles of two 1 0 0 type poles. So, if that be the case, this is the, pos this is the 1 1 0 pole, this is another location of another 1 1 0 type pole, this is another location of another 1 0 0 type of pole like this, this, this and this. Now, how to find out the indices of all those poles. For example, the ind indices of this pole here, you know, midway between the poles 1 0 0 and 0 1 0 is 1 1 0. So, how we get to that? Now, look at this. So, the pole between the 1 0 0 and the 0 1 0 is 
the 110 type and how we find out the indices? Now, we add up the indices of this pole as well as that pole. So, 100 HKL plus 010. So, you add up it is 110. So, you see that in a very simple manner it is possible to find out the indices of this pole. Similarly, if we want to find out the indices of this pole, how we are going to do that? Now, it is lying midway between a bar 100 pole and a 010 pole. So, if we add up the indices, it will be bar 1 plus 0, that is bar 1, 1 plus 0, 1, then 0 plus 0, 0. So, it will be bar 110. So, in this manner, it is possible to find out the indices of all the other 110 type poles. So, this one will be bar 110 as we have seen already. This one will be bar 1, bar 10. One, this one will be bar 1, 0, 1. This one is 0, bar 1, 1. This one will be 1, 0, 1. And this one will be 0, 1, 1. And finally, this one will be 1, bar 1, 0. So, what we have done now in the same stereographic projection, we have now plotted not only the poles of the 100 type of planes, but also the poles of the 110 type planes. Now, let us try to figure out how in the same pole figure, uh, uh, in the same stereographic projection, uh, we can plot the poles of the 111 type of planes. Now, how we can plot the poles of the 111 type of planes in the same stereographic projection. Now, in order to do that, we will have to take the help of the zonal relationship which we derived in the previous course. In the previous course, we have seen that if a plane HKL belongs to a zone for which the zone axis is UV w, in that case this relation h u plus k v plus l w must be equal to 0. So, we know the zonal relationship that a plane h k l will belong to a zone for which u v w is the zonal axis only and only when h u plus k v plus l w becomes equal to 0. Now, <coughs> say for example, if we draw a longitude line passing through the bar 100 zero zero pole, the 0 1 1 pole and the 1 0 0 pole, then all the planes which will lie on this longitudinal line, they will form a zone. And what will be the zone axis? The zone axis will be 90 degree from each point of this longitude line. So, you see that if you move 90 degrees, for example, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. So, from here to here, if we move 90 degrees, then we can say that the planes which will lie, whose poles will lie on this longitude line, they must form a zone because each point has a distance of 90 degree from this point. That means, all those planes will form a zone with this as the zone axis. So, if we draw a longitude line passing through bar 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1 and 1, 0, 0, then you know each longitude line, there are plenty of planes which will lie on this longitude line and if we get away from this along the equator to the point 
0 bar 1 1 then we find that this point is making 90 degree angle with each and every point lying on this longitude line. So you see that <coughs> this pole here is at 90 degrees with all the poles lying on this longitude line. That means the planes which lie, whose poles will lie on this longitude line, they will form a zone and this will be the zone axis. Now, if that be so, we can see that we can, we can draw a second uh, longitude line in this manner passing through 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 and 0 bar 1, 0. Now, if we go 90 degree along that, then this pole will be making 90 degree with all the poles lying on that longitude line. That means all the planes whose poles lie on this longitude line, they will form a zone and this will be the zone axis. So the intersection between this longitude line and this longitude line is this point. So this pole will be such that it belongs to both this longitude line and both and this longitude line. That means this pole must be the one which belongs to the zone for which this is the zone axis and also belong to the zone for which this is the zone axis. That means 0 bar 1 1 and also bar 1 0 1. That means this is a point, this is a pole of a plane and the plane is such that it will belong both to this zone as well as to this zone. That means it must satisfy the H u plus k v plus L w is equal to 0 relationship with this axis as well as this axis. Now what is the plane which makes this kind of a relationship with both the axes? Now an inspection will always tell us that it is the 1 1 1 plane because if H k L are 1 1 1 and this is u v w you can see that 1 multiplied by 0 is 0, 1 multiplied by bar 1 is minus 1, 1 multiplied by 1 is plus 1. So it does have a zonal relationship with this axis. Similarly, this will also have a zonal relationship with this axis because 1 into bar 1 minus 1, 1 into 0 is 0, 1 into 1 is plus 1. So H u plus k v plus L w is equal to 0. So it is the 1, 1, 1 plane which really is the one that belongs to both this zone as well as this zone. So that is the reason why the intersection point is the 1, 1, 1 pole. Now we can find a thumb rule how to get the indices of this pole. So it is in this quadrant and you see that if we add up the indices of this, this and this we get the indices of that. So that is exactly what we do. HKL 1 0 0 is this one, then 0 1 0 this one, 0 0 1 is this one. So add them up you get 1 1 1. In a similar way it is possible to find out the other locations of the 1 1 1 type of poles and this is what we have done it here. For example, a second 1, 1, 1 type of pole will be lying here, a third 1, 1, 1 type of pole will be lying here, a fourth 1, 1, 1 type of pole will be lying here. And in a manner similar to what I have described previously, you add up the indices, for example, indices of this pole, this pole and this pole and arrive at the indices of this, add up the indices of this pole, this pole and this pole, arrive at the indices of this add up the indices of this pole, this pole and this pole and arrive at the indices of this pole. So in this way we can find a stereographic projection where 1 0 0, 1 1 0, 1 1 1 all the poles have been drawn and you can continue doing like that 
put the poles of 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3 type of planes, etc., etc. Now, you see on the globe, you will find there are two types of lines drawn. For example, you know, we know that in the middle is the east west axis, which is called the equator, and there is an axis connecting the north and the south poles. And you can see that there are two types of lines drawn on the surface of the globe, and this diagram is a projection of that. So, there are two kinds of lines which are drawn, one connecting the north and the south pole over the globe. So, there are lines connecting the north and the south pole over the globe, and all these lines are of the same size. And these are also the biggest circles that can be drawn on the surface of the globe. So, all the lines are known as the longitude lines. So, all the longitude lines are of the same length and they are the biggest, they are big circles so to say. And then a second set of lines are drawn parallel to the equator. So, if you have the equator, you draw another set of parallel lines parallel to the equator at regular intervals along the north, along the south. And those are known as the latitude lines. The, so, the big circles, you know, drawn from the north and south over the surface of the globe, these are known as the longitude lines and the smaller circles drawn parallel to the equator, they are known as the latitude lines. We have to remember that this is a two-dimensional projection showing all the latitude and the longitude lines. Now, the equator itself is also a big circle. So, we uh, distinguish between the two types of lines, the longitude lines and the latitude lines. So, we distinguish between the two types of lines, the longitude lines and the latitude lines. So, the longitude lines are drawn by connecting the north and south pole over the surface of the globe. So, these are all which are known as big circles. These are the big circles. Now, the equator also is a big circle because if the size of the equator if you look at the, uh, is the same as that of the size of any of those longitude lines. Now, what about latitude lines? These are called the small circles and actually the size of the circles decreases as we move away from the equator to the north or from the equator to the south. Now, these lines, the latitude lines and longitude lines, these are used to measure angle between poles, angle between a uh, plane and another plane, angle between a plane and a direction, etcetera, etcetera. So, in order to do that, we use what is known as a wolf net. So, we use what is known as a wolf net. So, what is a wolf net? The wolf net is nothing but a projection of the globe on which all the longitude and latitude lines are drawn. So, these are the longitude lines connecting the north and south over the surface of the globe and these are the latitude lines which are drawn parallel to the equator. Now, we can draw the lines at different intervals. So, in bigger wolf nets, we can have the longitude and latitude lines drawn at an interval of 2 degrees. Um, in some ones, they can be drawn at the intervals of 5 degrees or 10 degrees according to what we need. Now, once we have such a wolf net, as we will show red, uh, see readily, that it is possible to measure the angle between poles uh, or the angle between planes quite easily. Say, for example, if we have got two planes as shown over here, if we have got two planes and 
this is the perpendicular to one plane and this is the perpendicular to the other plane, then say this angle is alpha. So, is the actual is the angle between the actual angle between the planes 1 and 2. So, if we extend these perpendiculars, they will touch what is known as a longitude line. And as you can see, in the longitude line, we can easily measure it out. So, we can always measure the angle between two planes. Say, here the two planes are, one is this one, this is one of the planes, you know, is the extended plane. The other plane is this one, the extended plane. So, these two planes make an angle of alpha, say. So, this is alpha. Now, if we draw perpendiculars to these planes, then it will cut a longitude line as shown here. So, this angle is the same as this angle. That means, the angle between two planes can be easily read out from the angle between the two corresponding poles of the planes. So, these are A and B are nothing but the two poles of the two planes. So, it is quite possible to measure the actual angle between two planes from uh, their respective poles. Now, the question may be asked that can we measure angle between two poles using a latitude line. As I have already shown, we can do it by taking into consideration a longitude line. Say this is a longitude line which is a, which is a big circle. So, from here if you can plot two poles of the two planes, we can measure out the angle and that will be the angle between planes. Now, is it possible to use a latitude line to do the same job. Now, you see that it is quite a different proposition. Say for example, if we have a distance between two poles A and B, this much is the distance. Now, if we are on this small circle and if on the other hand, we are on this big circle, then what we find? The same distance between the two poles will give you a much bigger, um, you know, will, will give you, a, 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 you know, for example, here the angle between these two poles will subtend a much smaller angle when you consider measurement along this line. But at the same time, we if we consider this smaller, you know, line, then here this distance, the same distance will subtend a much larger angle. You see, the latitude lines are not all of the same size, you know, they have varying sizes. So, you see that the same distance between two poles can be interpreted as making a much bigger angle when we are on a larger sized latitude line than uh, you know, um, much, you know, I, I'm sorry, the same distance between the two poles will give you a much smaller angle when the measurement is made on a bigger sized latitude line than when the measurements are made on a smaller sized latitude lines. That is the reason why we never use a latitude line for measuring the angle between poles. Now, once we have got the wolf net, we can trace out the entire wolf net on a uh, tracing paper and put it on top of the net as we have done over here. Now, any pole can simply be plotted in this manner. Say for example, if we want to plot a pole which is 20 degrees north, 50 degrees east. What does it mean? That the pole is such that it lies on the 20 degree north latitude and 50 degree east latitude. You see, uh, 50 degree east longitude, sorry. So, it is a pole which is 20 degree north, 50 degree east. What it means? That means, you know, as you go from 
equator to the north, you will be encountering all the latitude lines. So, when I say 20 degree north means I am on the 20 degree north latitude. So, if this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, so will be the 20 degree north latitude will be somewhere here. But only one uh, coordinate is good enough. You have to give the other coordinate on the longitude line. So, if it is a 50 degree east latitude, longitude, then what it means that we have to go, you know, this is the long, this is the 10 degree east longitude, this is the 20 degree east longitude, 30 degree east longitude, etcetera, etcetera, and this is the 90 degree east longitude. So, this point 20 degree north, 50 degree east, we can easily locate by moving 20 degree along the latitude line on the 20 degrees north latitude line and then move to the 50 degree east point. So, we come over here. Similarly, if we have a pole at say 0 degrees north, 70 degrees east, then how we plot it? We go, you know, this is 0 degrees north or 0 degrees south. That means, the right at the center and then you are, we are here. So, 0 degree north means it is 0 degree north means right at the center of the wolf net. Then 70 degree east, so you go along the equator by 70 degrees, so you are here. So, this is the 0 degree north, 70 degree east pole. In a similar way, we can plot the pole 30 degree south, 20 degree east. So, you can go to 30 degree south latitude and then move to 20 degree east longitude and you come over here. Similar way, if we want to plot the pole 50 degree south, 0 degree west, we simply come from the center to 50 degree south and do not go anywhere either to the right or the left and we get the pole 50 degree south, 0 degree west. Now, suppose we want to find out the angle between two poles 20 degree north, 50 degree east and 30 degree south, 20 degree east as we have shown here. You see, we want to find out the angle between this pole and this pole. So, how we can measure the angle between two poles? We know that if we can bring the two poles on the same longitude line, then we can measure out the angle straight away. So, that is exactly what we will do. So, what we do for that purpose? You see, all these poles are plotted on a tracing paper and this is put on top of the fixed uh, uh, wolf net. So, now we what we do? Once you have got these two poles, once you have got these two poles, we rotate the tracing paper with respect to the wolf net. Once we do that, it is quite possible to bring the two poles lying on the same longitude line and then we can simply measure out the angle from the graduated wolf net which is 60 degree. So, you see that it is quite easy to figure out the angle between two poles by taking both the poles on the same longitude line and then simply measuring out according to the wolf net. So, the angle between the poles 20 degree north, 50 degree east and 30 degree south, 20 degree east is 60 degrees as we see here. Now, very often we come across a term called the trace of a plane. So, what is the trace of a plane? So, if you have a plane in the uh, unit cell and allow the plane to extend in space, it will cut the reference sphere, you know, along a circle like that. So, this is the trace of a plane. And if we look at the trace, so this is the trace of the top plane here, that is the 0, 0, 1 plane. So, this is the trace of the 0, 0, 1 plane. That means, if we take the 0, 0, 1 plane and allow it to extend, this is where it will meet the reference sphere and so it is the trace of the plane. Now, if we take the perpendicular to the 0, 0, 1 plane, it will go and meet the point north over here. That means, this is the 
this will be the pole of the plane. So, if this is the trace of the plane, this will be the pole of the plane. So, if we have uh, you know uh, the trace of a plane and the pole of the plane, they make an angle 90 degree between them. So, this is a very important relationship. Now, if we have another plane, say for example, the 0, 1, 0, the right hand side plane, so this will be the trace and you know the pole can be either this or this. So, again the relationship is the trace of a plane and the pole of a plane make 90 degree angle with each other. Now, let us suppose that this is the trace of a plane as we find, you know, as we plot on the tracing paper and then put it on top of the wolf net. Now, say we have to find out the pole of the plane. So, what we do, you know, what is our next step? So, we know that the pole will be at 90 degree to the trace. So, first of all what we do, we rotate the tracing paper on which the trace has been drawn with respect to the underlying wolf net, so that the trace lies on a longitude line. So, this is what is shown in the next figure. So, the, you see that we rotate the uh, tracing paper with the trace, uh, uh, you know, so that it lies on a longitude line and then simply go 90 degree along the equator. So, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. So, you see that this is the pole of the trace. So, the trace of a plane which is this, you know, the pole of the plane is over here. So, now we have to get back to the original position of the uh, trace. So, that is what we do. So, we go back to the original position by changing the, uh, by rotating the uh, 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 tracing paper with respect to the wolf net and the pole moves over here and we read out the uh, uh, location. It will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 50 degrees east and 20 degrees north. So, if you have a trace of a plane, you can easily find out the uh, a pole of the plane in this manner. So, what are the steps involved? You have the trace first, you want if you want to find out the pole, the next step will be to rotate the tracing paper on which the uh, trace has been drawn in such a manner with respect to the wolf net, so that it coincides with a longitude line. So, this is the situation. Then you go 90 degree away from the trace and you find out the pole. Then move back again to take the trace to the original position. The pole travels over here and you read out the coordinates which is 20 degrees north, 50 degrees east. Again, another problem may arise that we have been given the pole of a plane, we have to figure out what is the trace of the plane. So, how we are going to do that? Again, what we do? The tracing paper on which the pole is plotted is rotated in such a manner that it comes on the equator line. So, the next figure shows that. So, you have brought it to the equator and then move 90 degree away from this 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, this and draw the uh, longitude line through this point and we get the trace of the plane. So, we do exactly the opposite to what we did earlier in order to plot the trace of a plane from its pole. So, what we do? We simply rotate the tracing paper with the pole on it such that it comes on the equator, uh, on the equator line. So, this is what we have done and then along the equator move 90 degree and draw the longitude line as shown here. And then the next step is go back to the original position. So, we go back to the original position. So, if this is the pole of the plane, this is the trace of the plane. You see several times we find that we come across a number of planes which belong to a particular zone. Say for example, on a tracing paper we have plotted out four poles and we can easily check whether they lie on a zone and how to check that? Again, we rotate the tracing paper 
on which the poles have been drawn with respect to the underlying valve net. And once you do that, you know, you find there will be a position when, you know, they are, you know, when you do that, you'll find they will be lying on a particular longitude line. If it is so, then we can easily say that the poles A, B, C, and D, they do lie on a zone. If we cannot bring all the poles on a single longitude line, then they do not lie on the same zone. Now, once we have got the uh, zone of planes, how to uh, figure out where the um, zone axis will be? Again, it is quite simple. We rotate the tracing paper with this longitude line in such a manner that they coincide, the ends coincide with north and south. We do that and then we move 90 degree away from this along the equator and find the zone axis. So in this way, if you are given a number of uh, poles, you know, you can figure out whether they lie on the same zone if you find that the, all the poles can be brought on a single longitude line, then that will show that all those poles or all those planes belong to a particular zone. And once that is found out, you simply move along the equator by 90 degrees to find out the zone axis. In a similar manner, it is also quite possible to figure out uh, the zone from the zone axis. 